my pleasure to welcome you to our new facility. We're, as you gathered, pretty proud of our space here. I'm Bobby Paulette. I'm Director of Preservation Department and for the Center of Preservation and Conservation for Yale University Libraries. And welcome to our seventh of our preservation lectures. This one is sponsored by Jack, class of 47, and Betsy O'Neill. As you will hear from our panel, conservation needs are evolving. And to meet those needs, the spaces are changing. Though for some of you who saw our space with some of the equipment that probably looks familiar from 15th century prints, you're wondering, is it really new? Yes, there's <laughs> lots of new. Um, so today's conservation labs deal not only with the old, but also needs to take into consideration the new demands and expanded use of science and study of cultural materials. Our panelists have all been involved in renovations of a space or a complete design of new spaces. Full disclosure, it wasn't until we had assembled the panel that I realized that all of our panelists are graduates of the University of Texas at Austin Library and Information Sciences <laughs> Master's Program and have a certificate in advanced study in, li in library and archival conservation. But as the only graduate level conservation training program that focused on libraries and archives, it's perhaps not a surprise. So let me introduce our panelists. I'm going to introduce them in the order they'll be speaking. Beth Doyle, who is head of conservation services department in the Leona B. Carpenter Senior Conservator at Duke University Libraries, where she's been since 2002. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts in Photography from the University of Dayton and a Master's in Advanced Certificate from UT. She is, an acti she is active at the local and state level and has served on several American Library Associations and American Institute for Conservation Interest Groups. Beth was granted fellow status in the American Institute for Conservation in 2014. Our next speech speaker is Jennifer Hayne Tupper. She's the Bud Veld Veldy Preservation Librarian, Head of Preservation at the University of Illinois Libraries. <coughs> Excuse me. She began there as Head of Conservation in 2001. She had gotten her Master's and Advanced Certificate from UT in 2000. She now teaches several preservation and conservation related courses in the Graduate School of Library and Information Science at the University of Illinois, and also serves as an instructor at the Campbell Center for Historic Preservation. She designed the University of Illinois Conservation Lab, which opened in 2006 and edited the 2012 book, The Planning and Construction of Book and Paper Conservation Laboratories, a Guidebook. Our third speaker is Eliza Gilligan. She's the book conservator for the University Library Collections at the University of Virginia Library. And she's worked there since Mar March of 20, 2009. Prior to UVA, Eliza worked at the Smithsonian Institution Libraries and Michigan State University Libraries. Eliza designed labs for all three institutions <coughs> and participated in multiple renovations and reconfigurations of conservation and preservation workspaces. She received her master's and advanced certificate from UT in 2000. And finally, there's our Christine McCarthy. She is the chief conservator for the Yale University Library Preservation Department's conservation and exhibition services. She joined the staff in 2008 as the head of the Special Collections Collection. In 2010, Christine's responsibilities expanded to include the conservation operations for the general collections, in addition to exhibition support and special collections treatment. She represents Yale University's conservation community as an active member of Mellon-funded international project, Conservation Space. Christine received her master's in advanced certificate of, from UT and has a BFA in illustration and design from the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. She's a professional associate at, with the, um, she's a professional associate member of the American Institute for Conservation. In her previous positions at the University of Chicago and MIT, she established new programs. At the University of Chicago, she worked with architects to design a treatment la laboratory as part of the building expansion for the Regenstein Library. The way we're going to structure this is each of the panelists have a brief formal presentation, and then I'll pose a series of questions that they will um, start to address. What we're hoping to do is start a conversation. So we'll go through those series of questions. You each have an index card. There's a pencil floating around somewhere on, on your row. <laughs> Feel free to jot down questions. 
We are recording this, and the microphones you see are for the rec recording. We're not amplifying anything. So we also have an overflow room where there's some folks, and so they will be the ones that will have to rely solely on the index cards. We'll have somebody bringing them in. But for those of you here, you are free to ask the question yourself, but if you don't want to, you can pass the index card to the center of the aisle when I call for that, and someone will take it up and I'll simply uh, relay the question to the panelists. So please join me in welcoming our panelists, and Beth will be the first one to speak. So in the South, I should say that you have to respond to that or it's very rude. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> if I learned that lesson really quickly. Um, so I want to thank Yale and Bobby for inviting me today and thank you all for coming. This is a beautiful space and we appreciate you sharing it with us. Uh, the Duke University Libraries Vern and Tanya Roberts Conservation Lab is a hybrid lab. That is, we work on both special collections as well as general collections in the same space. I was hired in 2002 to develop the conservation program. At the time, we had three technicians and myself. Our space consisted of two large rooms that you see here, separated by a semi-public hallway, and we shared both of these rooms with the binder unit. Our supplies were in that hallway on pallets on the floor and on hand-me-down shelving. My staff was really productive, uh, despite the fact that they spent a lot of time and physical energy working around the limitations of that space. We had no room for growth. We didn't have space to add a lot of equipment. And this really limited the types of treatments that we could do, especially for special collections. The good news was that the library had already embarked on a major renovation that included a new conservation lab. We moved to temporary space. Um, and the medical campus in 2006, and the new lab was opened in 2008. <coughs> the new lab was purpose-built for us. We have adequate space to move around and store supplies, uh, and we were also able to install a lot of large equipment, um, as well as things like fume hoods and washing sinks. Duke University is also very committed to having good ergonomic workspaces, and because of that, we have a cork floor, electric sit-to-stand benches for everybody, and special ergonomic chairs at each bench. The new space allowed us to improve our workflows to better control our supply inventories, which means better budget control, right? Um, and improve our documentation practices. We also have room to add staff or spread out if a treatment demands that space. Most importantly, it allowed us to envision a more robust and integrated conservation program for the library. We were able to expand our services to include mold removal, chemical treatments, washing, and humidification and flattening. It also allowed us to develop and expand services for the exhibits program and the digital production center. And if you're interested to see a video tour of the lab, um, there's one on YouTube at that link. The greatest benefit of this space is the opportunities that it affords our program. We recently hosted Gowan Weaver's Photograph Conservation for Non-Photo Conservators workshop and that um, we invited about 15 people plus the instructors into the space. We also hosted an object conservator who spent a few days working in our lab on items from our History of Medicine collection. Having the flexibility to have conservators come to us uh, exposes us to other conservation specialties and builds our conservation community. I'm very interested in doing more of these sorts of things in the future and our space really allows us to do that. The lab has become uh, a major stop on the library development office tour. We give tours to students and faculty, advisory board members, donors, alumni, and colleagues interested in renovating their labs. Most importantly, our space and services are highlighted on tours for donors whose collections they are considering depositing at our library. The work we do is a value added service that we can provide for their collections and shows our commitment to the care of those materials. And last year, we received a donation to Conservation's Adopt-A-Book Fund 
as a direct result of the behind the scenes tours we hosted on alumni weekend. So it was really exciting to be part of the outreach and fundraising efforts of the library. I believe by engaging our library colleagues, the academic community, and donors in these ways, we not only get to show off our work in space, but we can demonstrate that we are a key component in making collections accessible and are an integral part of the life of the library. Thank you. Hi, thank you all. <laughs> I'm from Pennsylvania, I don't have that same requirement. Um, so I'm here representing the University of Illinois lab. Um, I think I actually have the oldest lab. Our lab is now 10 years old. Um, this is a picture from the good old days uh, before we moved over. This was as nice as our old space got. Um, I want to point out a couple highlights, other than our fantastic staff, of course. Um, but, but our old space was, as, as many of you know, um, or have similar experiences in the basement, um, we did have garden level lighting, which looked out onto the very scenic loading dock, which sucked in fumes periodically, which was really nice. Um, we had the most fantastic matching 1950s vintage all steel office furniture ever, um, which was exceedingly non ergonomic <laughs> um, and really didn't offer very good workspace, but obviously we made it work. Um, the, the biggest hindrance here to our old space and the big reason for pushing for a new lab was that there was absolutely no water and chemical treatments possible in this space. It was just a basement space in our library. Um, and so our goal was to get out of our space and off of that floor entirely before we clogged up the women's room sink with so much PVA buildup <laughs> that everybody hated us because there was only one sink to wash out all of our brushes in and it was shared with the lavatory. Um, so. Um, Good news is, is that when I came to the University of Illinois in 2001, there was hope. Um, <laughs> the library had embarked on, like many other academic libraries, um, funding to build a high dense, Harvard style high density storage facility. And in that was planned a conservation lab. And so when they hired my position as the first head of conservation, the plan was to entice me with this forthcoming conservation lab. Um, that was 2001. In 2003, when they actually built and, and um, finished, well, 2003, 2004, finished the construction on the high density storage facility, they recognized that they had not budgeted nearly enough money for the very high tech HVAC system that high density book storage requires. And the only thing you can actually cut out of that budget was the conservation lab, because everything else was book storage. Um, so then there was a lot of heavy fundraising to make the lab happen, which is why I'm now at the Bud Veldy Conservation Lab. Thank goodness for Bud Veldy at the University of Illinois. Um, so we moved into that space actually in 2006. Um, simple floor plan simply because our space doesn't photograph real well, unfortunately. Lots of long, skinny spaces. Um, but just to give you an overview of what we have in the space, obviously a nice big lab space. Um, wet lab, et cetera. I'll show you some individual pictures. Um, ample office space for staff growth, which we, which we have almost completely encompassed now within 10 years. So I thought we had more space than we could possibly use. After 10 years, we filled up pretty much every single niche in this lab. Um, dirty space, which I'll be talking about in just a second. Um, but most importantly, we have this giant conference room slash reference space slash classroom slash everything else. And that has honestly been one of the most valuable spaces for us because we do do a lot of education with our Graduate School of Library and Information Science. We do a lot of donor relations and bring people in and kind of do a lot of orientations in there. Um, but it's also great surge space for us to have, you know, the, the random huge moldy collections that come in that we need to put somewhere. Um, it's great to have an extra surge space built like that. I would say that this whole square footage is about 5,000 square feet. Um, and, and I was really, really, really proud. I am still very proud of our lab. Um, but I have to say that coming here and seeing the beautiful facilities at Yale has been maybe, wah, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Illinois. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, you guys still have the new car smell on your lab and mine's worn off, so. Okay, um, so looking at the space, we have fantastic natural light. We actually may have too much natural light now. So despite shades and whatnot, um, we do find that in the winter months, um, sometimes it still gets a bit bright in our lab, but it's so much better than being in the basement. And the natural light is obviously fantastic. Um, 
almost nothing is fixed in our lab. Everything is mobile, which has turned out to be um, essential as our program has changed. And that's one of the things that I think, because I came in when there almost really was no program at the University of Illinois. We were one of the first labs that was funded as part of the um, Mellon Foundation initiative to start building labs in institutions that didn't have them. Um, so when I came in, I was the head of conservation and the only person in conservation other than one book repair tech. And you know we've grown to six FTE and 2.5 hourlies, at 2.5 FTE hourlies at this point. So planning for how those people were gonna use that space was kind of challenging when you're designing a lab with no staff there yet. And so the fluidity and the mobility of all that um, equipment was really, really important. Um, so we've got one little wall of built-in um, cabinets and whatnot, but absolutely everything else is mobile and adjustable and ergonomic and height adjustable and everything else, all those good things. Um, we do have the, the essential wet lab, obviously. Um, this is one of the areas that um, I didn't plan very well for. We, I'm a book conservator, um, and so, or was a book conservator, I should say, unfortunately. And so when we designed this lab, I'm thinking, books. Then we hired a paper conservator. You paper conservators take up a phenomenal amount of space. Oh my god. Um, and so when our paper conservator came, we had to rethink not only the layout of the general lab, which I said was mobile, so we made it work, um, but the wet lab has now kind of become her territory. And so um, the, what I thought ample six foot fume hood um, is no longer ample for a paper conservator. And so now we have to look at install, we're actually actively installing a snorkel system to make basically every working surface in that space um, suitable for fume evacuation, which it was not previously. And then um, of all the rooms that I wish we had more square footage, uh, we have our dirty slash quarantine space, which is really much more quarantine than it ever has been dirty. Um, although it gets dirty, but in the really yucky sense. So this is where anything buggy, wet, pooped on, moldy, et cetera, comes in and gets quarantined. And we had been shocked by the, um, the embrace from our special collections units in having this space and bringing in all of their disgusting gifts <laughs> into our space for us to deal with them. Um, th this looks really empty and, and um, almost spacious. Uh, usually this every surface in here is covered with something, unfortunately, because our buildings are very old, they leak like a sieve, and we're always getting in gross gifts. So I wish I could triple the size of this room, unfortunately. All right, thank you, and we'll move on. Hi, everyone. Um, let's see. So the University of Virginia Library. Um, I am the first book conservator ever hired by the university library, which um, is kind of amazing considering the, the scope of their uh, rare book library. And so the uh, program, but the program was underway for briefly before I got there. Holly Robertson was a previous head of preservation. She had a nascent book repair unit. There was a commercial binding operation, and then she wrote a Mellon grant uh, to, to sort of be, the, like Jen said, the um, start a conservation lab, hire a conservator, and then create an endowment to fund the preservation administrator position. Um, so, Things happen, you write a grant, you have a plan, you think it's just gonna go like clockwork and then things change. Um, when Holly wrote the grant, she thought that the university was going to coalesce around this idea. She had brought on board the uh, University Art Museum, the Office of the Architect, and the Kluge Roo Art Museum, which is a huge collection of Australian Aboriginal bark paintings. And she had identified a building on campus just a little bit apart from the main campus that we could build a big collaborative conservation facility sort of w something like this maybe a little smaller um, and um, just a conservation facility so she wrote the grant with that in mind they hired me with that in mind the idea being oh this is all going to happen this is all going to happen so by the time I move to Charlottesville and show up on my first day, they're like, well, things have changed a little bit. And we're still going to do the collaborative conservation facility, but meanwhile, we have a temporary conservation space for you in a swing space building on campus where when we're renovating the art studios, we put their, their offices. So they gave me this space, which was formerly a photography dark room for the art studio, 
And Holly's original plan for this space had been, oh, they're going to give us 2,400 square feet, and we can put in book repair, we can put in box making, we can put in supplies, and this and that and the other. The university said, no, 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 you get this end of the building, 663 square feet. And so all the big plans had to be scrunched down. But it was only going to be temporary. So plan this, but also plan your future lab, and then figure out how you're going to integrate it with the book repair unit that you actually aren't going to be contiguous with. But that's what we had in the grant. <laughs> so we, you know, we talked with the Mellon Foundation and kept them apprised. But that meant that I was juggling a lot of concepts and, and a lot of workflows, also with the new head of preservation, Kara McClurkin. So the idea for the conservation lab was build every, everything you can do full service, just scrunch it up a little bit and make sure that everything we put in that room can move out of that room and be implemented in the new facility and be grown into a new facility. So, so that's where we started. And like I said, 663 square feet. And the original plan had been all kinds of custom um, built-in cabinets and cubby holes and things for uh, storage of supplies. But there was no way I was going to be able to do storage of big supplies. And the idea of custom furniture that would then be wooden, wooden furniture that would then move to a new facility, I was like, OK, that's not going to work. Um, and so I changed the concept quite a bit. I said, we're going to go with a university vendor who provides the casework and the benches and the countertops for the science labs because they will come in, they will do exactly what we want, they will give us a good price, and then when it comes time to move, we can get more casework, we can get whatever, we can build on the original concept, and they'll still be around, and it'll all work fabulously. Um, and so there's the, that was the lab standing at one end, um, and you can see that the sink and everything hasn't been quite attached. This is me turning around the other way, and ta-da, you see the washing sink, the lockers to hang coats and so on, and this is before the, um, the flat file cabinets were installed. Um, so while this is all going on, I'm designing the collaborative conservation lab, um, and we're doing donor packets and brochures, and everything was going to be fabulous, and then things changed. Um, that that investor in New York turned out to be a fraud, and a lot of people who had money <laughs> then didn't have money. So um, it, it became apparent that I was really going to have to make a, a permanent home of this facility. So seven years in, um, this is the facility in working order. And it is just me, um, or for, for most, the most of the time, it has been just me working in this conservation lab. Um, every summer, I would hire a six-week conservation intern. And then the past few years, I had a graduate intern from NYU. So I've been able to spread out, um, which can be really nice if all the benches are yours. Um, <laughs> and I can really figure out how things are, you know, how do things work. Um, I can st stage treatment really well. One of the big drawbacks, though, is I am very isolated. I am a 15-minute walk from the main library buildings, so we never get donor tours. Um, or we've tried. We have open houses. People don't really come, or it's pouring rain, and then nobody really wants to come. I mean, one open house, we had this one lady who trudged with, through the rain with her husband holding the umbrella over her, and she just desperately wanted to see the conservation lab because years ago she had been interested in conservation and her life took another turn and you know there and then she pulled out a check and wrote me a check for a hundred dollars which was really really sweet but I mean that's the level of engagement you can get when you are not in easy strolling distance from the director's office um, so that that's a big drawback I also spend a lot of time running back and forth if somebody finds a moldy book you know I get off get off my chair hustle on over um, if things need, need sort of quick fixes in special collections building, I load up my bag with tools and methyl cellulose or whatnot, and I run over and I'm like, 
oh wait, I needed something else because the person described it a certain way and they didn't use the terminology. And again, when you're the only conservator at an institution, you're the, you're the one-man band. You're trying to train the staff to understand what you can do, what you can't do, and um, how to think about conservation. So um, those are some of the drawbacks. Um, but that said, um, you can do a lot in 663 square feet, although, um, do we have a, a pointer? Oh, no, no, come back. <laughs> I was gonna say, if you look back to where the pegboard is over the washing sink, to the right, there's this sort of square, big white square box. That's the air handler system. So this is, that lab is all we have in that building. And so when the air handler system died, um, the facilities guys were like, well, we've got to take out the old one and put in a new one. And so they're like, well, you're the only, this is the only working space I have. I'm in the middle of treatment. What do you do? You just sort of keep going. And the fellows were like, literally like chopping up bits of the HVAC <laughs> system and pulling it out. And then, and then they had to put it, ordered the new one, and it was bigger than the old one. And so then they had to take down a wall and, <laughs> and, and make the, the, the booth for the air handler bigger. So I did lose a little bit of square footage. Um, so another drawback of, of this facility is that there's no um, temperature, well, there's temperature control, but no relative humidity control. If it rains outside, the humidity goes way up. And it's no joke. We track it. And my boss and I are still advocating for uh, a new space that hasn't happened yet. Um, but then again, the university is m going to be renovating the main library building, so maybe something will happen there. Um, the other tricky thing about this space is that um, people still don't know what conservation is to a certain degree. I have, um, t I go to town meetings and do presentations. I spend a lot of time with special collections people, cultivating them and, and and educating on them on what conservation can do, but then that means the rest of the library doesn't really know. So outreach is a constant effort on my part and a constant effort on my boss's part. Um, and then, you know, when interns come, I make them give presentations and things like that. But um, there you have it. Um, I think Bobby's questions for us will sort of flesh things out. But uh, on to Yale. have slides, but since most of you have seen the spaces, <laughs> I don't feel like I have to do work quite so hard to describe the wonderfulness that is our <laughs> new <laughs> laboratory. <laughs> but um, as Bobby said, I'm the chief conservator for the libraries here. That means I'm the head of conservation and exhibit services. Uh, and you met many of the fabulous staff that I work with to take care of the library's collections. So my presentation is entitled Conservation Studio to Conservation Laboratory. So, some of you may remember or had seen the space. In 1974, I actually found the Preservation News announcement uh, when Jane Greenfield had turned what was a bookbinding studio in the library uh, into the fir library's first conservation studio. Sort of considered state of the art, all set up, fabulous, good to go. Uh, we continued to work in that space for 50 years. So, as you can see in the top corner, I've got the Preservation News. Some of you might have remembered that fume hood, still using it. It cost $418 in 1974. Uh, and it does not owe us a thing at this point. <laughs> uh, the other pictures are actually the befores of our space. This is 2008. So this is when I arrived and was hired by the library to take the post as the chief conservator. The top is our space on 1MB, which is a mezzanine level in Sterling Memorial Library, tucked off stacks, off publicly accessible hallways, a tiny 1930s sized hallway with book stacks, so probably about the width of this podium, to access a single door, no secondary egress, and an incredibly steep ramp that got you down into the sit face because it was sunken below. The lower picture uh, represents the fact that at some point, other parts of the operation kind of as we expanded, the initial space was the whole space. So that 1MB, it was about 1,400 square feet. Um, 
general collections at some point moved to a space in the basement. Uh, exhibit functions were also set up in the basement. Uh, so then we became a program on two different floors. Uh, we weren't really able to do much in terms of rearranging a lot of those spaces. None of them were really purpose-built in the basement. Uh, and the experience that Eliza described for us was sort of a daily occurrence because most of our spaces were built around or contained various parts of the SMLs, HVAC, water systems, fire suppression, uh, water sprinkler mains. You needed to fix anything in the building. It was somehow in one of our spaces, <laughs> all of the telecommunications wiring for the entire building. So we had a lot of, uh, you know, traffic with facilities, outside contractors, and others from the library who needed to come in and out. Uh, we did not have any way to add space. There was absolutely nowhere to go at this point. Uh, we could shuffle, we could rearrange. Uh, in 2010, Bobby managed to secure some money for us to do a sort of minor renovation to the spaces that we were using. Uh, that involved new lighting in the basement, new paint. We did the most to the lab upstairs that had started in 74 as the conservation lab. So we added a washing sink instead of a photo sink, a very narrow sink that actually, according to the pictures in the 74 article, I don't think we ever washed in the sink. I think we always washed in trays outside of the washing sink because it was, you know, an off the shelf photo developing sink for small eight by 10 photographs. So we added those things and that sort of bought us some time. There had been talk about plans for uh, a centralized facility of various uh, conservation operations on campus on York Street, that York Street building. That was the first project when I got here. So there was a very large plan developed for that. That did not come to happen. Yale purchased the West Campus property that's out in Orange. And there was talk about that building from scratch, a purpose-built facility that would house labs for all of the conservation labs on campus. Uh, due to the crash in 2008, there were some changes where that project was stalled. When it restarted, basically the scientific arm had become incredibly important, the idea of building um, a shared analytical and research facility where we could have folks like I.C. Onico, our director of scientific research for conservation. Uh, and those things sort of took precedence and an existing building needed to be modified. Also, the art gallery needed space for its operations. So that plan turned into a shared facility. So there was space at West Campus where we could use it on a temporary basis, but there was not sufficient space for us to move all of our operations out there. Also because of the way we work and as people know with libraries, we are just intimately tied to the collections here. And so with no other library presence on West Campus, it seemed difficult to move our day-to-day -day operations and easier to coordinate and work at West Campus for special projects and for anything that involved a kind of technical research study of material. Okay. So a lot of things started to happen between 2012 and 2014, which basically meant that a, a program that was sort of held in a little bit in stasis by the walls that existed, the physical walls, uh, began to kind of really burst out and to sort of respond to current changes in the field and needs. And so in 2012, Conservation and Exhibit Services was formed. General Collections had been a separate unit, and so that was brought under, and so there was the potential for that kind of crossover and cross-pollination in the ways that we work with things. Uh, we saw that as an opportunity because Yale has collections that, uh, general collections that really in many places are considered special collections. And so there are a lot of transitional material, that medium rare concept that was talked about years ago. And so we thought it might be an interesting thing to think about how we might have to retool our general collections operation. Um, three week workspaces, two different floors, three flights apart from one another, accessed by very tiny little winding stairs or a teeny tiny elevator in the public stacks hallway. So as you can imagine, that could be difficult. Uh, we moved PhotoDoc out of the main lab, but that went down to the basement, so that meant every object had to move up and down three flights for before and after photo documentation. Uh, we began to see a real change, though, in terms of a lot of outreach to the campus and thinking about how an internal embedded conservation lab should really facilitate and add something in addition to what a conservator and private practice might bring. And so that was sort of being engaged in teaching and some of the learning that's happening on campus with objects. So as you can see here, we have a number of examples of all the different kinds of things that started happening. Analytical testing, working with scientists, working with faculty, working with outside researchers. Uh, the lower picture 
on your left is uh, our traveling scriptorium in action. So those are students from, I believe, Barbara Shaler, who's with us today. Uh, her class, uh, learning to write and pretending to be scribes at a table. We did all of that in that tiny space, rearranging, shutting down every part of the operation to make that happen. And a lot of these things became very popular. As most people know in libraries, we see a lot of oversized material. So we can't continue to count on things being small, rare books. As much as we encourage those purchases, <laughs> and I see Ray Clements who's like, little books. We like octavo. Um, we see Tibetan tonkas. We see large oversized maps. We see physical three-dimensional objects. You may have seen the two Carnelli globes that are in the lab right now. And so the spaces were very difficult and very challenging to retool and to change for the different kinds of things we needed to do. Once we, um, we also hired uh, Warner Hahn who joined us and we have a new team in our, uh, what we call collections, conservation and housing. A Lot of new housing projects, a lot of need out there to house special unusual objects and just to protect things that are going to offsite shelving facilities. So that became a kind of really full blown operation that sort of transitioned our general collections into something else. So folks were really working together very closely. Um, our exhibits program was also growing. Carrie Sancombe, our exhibits uh, program manager was beginning to think about student exhibitions and working with students and needing to bring them into the space. So then we get to the Gates Conservation Laboratory in 2016. We are a true hybrid facility and for the first time we really can bring all of those places together that we had in Sterling so that the staff who always worked so well together and uh, worked very hard at that collaboration and the seamlessness in terms of what we did now have a space that physically reflects that and makes that a lot easier. Um, our design for the lab really ended up almost tripling the existing space we had. So at, a, at our top, we were about 3,000 square feet. Not much of that space in Sterling was like completely usable space. I mentioned the ramp. Uh, we had an opportunity to create functional areas like our wet treatment and uh, photo doc rooms and things that were separate from the primary main treatment space so that people weren't collapsing or moving their personal tables and workspaces so that we could accommodate what are pretty standard separate functions that are now reserved for people and they can use them. We stuck with a very open and flexible floor plan and I would say that that is a real credit to um, people like uh, Paula Zayas, our assistant chief conservator, Marie France LeMay, and all of the others on our team, uh, Karen and Ansley and Carrie, who we had worked so long and so hard in terms of making the other space work that we just kept what was good about that, which was that we need to be able to change ourselves as we need to and to respond to what's there. And that even when you get a lot of space, which we got a lot of space, <laughs> Uh, you still need to really think about that because no one ever really has enough space and there's just different ways to do that. So you'll notice that the built-ins are perimeter, not so much in the center. We kept our original mobile tables, put in tables to match those so that we could um, create that flexible uh, floor plan. And I think the other thing that's made a huge difference for us, as I mentioned, is critical adjacencies for us. We are <coughs> All together, PhotoDoc is off the main treatment area. The collections vault is right next to PhotoDoc. Uh, and I think that that helps us to stay in line with what is really good practice because you're not so tempted to skip a step or to think, you know, I've got to take this all the way down three flights. Is it really something I want to do to this object to take a photograph? And so I think we are just able to do all the things that we need to do so much more efficiently uh, and so much better. We do have a little bit of growth space. Um, as Beth mentioned, we're looking forward to not holding Beinecke classrooms hostage while we have consultants in to survey collections or to examine them. We can host uh, on-site private conservators because we have the space. We have never had an intern in the time that I'm here from the graduate programs because honestly they would have to sit on top of someone else. Would have had to build a loft or some sort of trailer in the parking lot for them. <laughs> and so that is something that we've been asked every year and so it's nice for the first time this year to say when uh, people call from Buffalo, yes, we would be happy to consider that. Um, I think that the team has an awful lot to offer and that the collections do too. The other critical thing for us that I think works is that the other parts of the preservation department have come with us and are in the same building. And more importantly, with the Beinecke's location here, they're 90% of our special collections work. Uh, more importantly, it just gives a nice, healthy library presence to this space so we don't feel isolated uh, in that way. And a lot of our work is back and forth with archivists and librarians from there, and so it, it makes things really great and really easy. Uh, so it's kind of a destination. Uh, Basie is with us today, too, from development, and we have had no shortage of walkthroughs. People will come. 
there have been two classes that have already come through in the six months we're here, and we have had at least one development tour or walkthrough or special visit uh, every month since we've been here, and, and we hope that that will continue. Thank you. Okay, so let's switch this. Um, I do have a series of questions. Many of the questions have been addressed in part uh, within the talk, but it'll give you opportunity to perhaps expand on various areas. One of the things I think almost every one of you mentioned that your labs are hybrid. And perhaps it might be good to talk a little bit about what that is and what's driven that sort of way of operating. Um, and whether that was, you know, is it programmatic or or, or then also the space, and it's all in one space. Is that programmatic that you've done the hybrid, or is it something else that's causing that? So I'm let you figure out who's going to answer that first. Oh, and you need to. I'll start because we have the microphone. Uh, as I mentioned, we it was a conscious decision on our part uh, because we had had segregated spaces for so long, uh, obviously kind of segregated in the extreme. Uh, but that we really did see that in many respects Yale's general collections operations were really changing. Uh, we still see some of the minor kinds of repair, but we don't see a lot of straightforward book repair. Certainly not the kind that I learned uh, when I was first a technician. We see a much more complicated and older materials, and so this allows us an opportunity for the technicians to have very similar and transferable skills, and for us to form smaller project teams that are kind of across all of those boundaries of skill and it just makes things more flexible and we can be better uh, able to respond to things. Um, as Kara and I have talked about the future of the conservation program at UVA, you know, we had one one future that we thought we were planning for and and with the collaborative conservation facility that was going to be built we thought well should we plan to move book repair and commercial binding and everything out of Alderman Library and ultimately we decided that we shouldn't because we wanted to have a physical presence in the main library. We didn't want people to forget what preservation and conservation did and if not enough library people were going to move out to the remote facility, whatever it was, we thought we would be too isolated, people would not know what we did and um, we would be just some satellite where mysterious things happened to books and then they came back in blue plastic totes and looked better. Mm -hmm. So we, we had never planned to move them all together unless we could be part of a bigger library facility. And then with the way things have worked out at UVA, I'm the, the little satellite and then I spend time coming back and forth. Um, I think the, the hybrid concept it creates a lot of flexibility and I think that's really important because programs change and people, um, staffing changes and you have opportunities to hire new people or people move out of your department for whatever reason. So I think having a hybrid program is really great and I think, you know, years ago people were saying, oh, book repair is going to go away and so this and that, that it is going to be a long, long time before book repair goes away. So I s also think for that reason we still need to plan for a hybrid programs. So in Illinois, we are a hybrid lab. Um, that was more because we had no lab to start, and so we had space for one lab, so it by essential had to be a hybrid lab because we weren't going to get a special collections lab anytime in the near future. Um, what I didn't mention, which I think is important, is that um, similar to some other folks, our, the, the Harvard-style facility that, we're, that our lab is occupied in is on the edge of campus. So we are similar, about a 15-minute walk. Um, however, we also have high-density storage, which for whatever reason, it really thrills donors. It's that whole like Indiana Jones yeah. experience. Um, so we have no problem getting donors yeah. out to our space. Um, but the space that we moved out into did require us, similar to UVA, to separate ourselves from preservation and a lot of the adjacencies that we have with the preservation program. Um, so while the conservation lab is hybrid, we are separated from preservation, which gives us a different sort of separation, um, but does bring us back then to the main library a lot more frequently. So um, within our facility, we have um, general book repair and or 
the way it was constructed, where we would have general book repair and then special collections conservation. Um, in the 10 years since we opened the lab, of course, similar to what Christine was implying with Yale, we've watched a lot of changes in the way we're approaching our book repair part of it. And while, no, book repair is not going away, it is changing. And our approaches to it are definitely changing. And with the adjacencies that we have with special collections, it's allowed us to start to develop actually a third and kind of gray in between workflow of medium rare. And to look at all that material that is not really rare, and it's not really general, but it sits somewhere in the middle. Um, and to be able to collaborate and work with people who have some of the skill sets that are more appropriate in special collections, even though the material doesn't sit in special collections, has allowed us a lot of um, more programmatic flexibility to do what we feel is really appropriate for our collections. Um, being similar to all of us here, you know, a large academic library, our print's not going anywhere. Um, but our print is going to become more and more important as an object over time. And so I think this, the hybrid approach is really important for us to be able to care for our massive general collections in a way that's important long term, not just slapping book tape on it or whatever. So, uh, Ditto. <laughs> <laughs> you won't go last next time. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what else to add to that other than I think um, it's one thing to look at it from a collection standpoint, but I'll just touch on what it does in terms of staff development. So having a hybrid lab really allows people to participate either directly or indirectly in skill building discussions that they might not get to do all of the time. Our technicians are all um, trained to some extent to do um, general collections work and special collections work. So if there's an all lab project and we need all hands on deck, they have the skills to do that. And I think that is really important because, you know, we hear a lot of rhetoric about how the general collections aren't important, they're going away, we don't need them. And we know that it's not true and we're actually the physical manifestation of the fact that that's not true. And so I think that hybrid space really allows us to show why it's important that all of these skills um, are needed and that the staffing levels that we have are needed for the collections that we have. Let me ask one more question, no one has opened it up. And the one I want to ask is, in your planning and design, to what extent and in what ways were you able to antip anticipate the non-treatment things that you're having to deal with? And Beth, you get to go first, so you... <laughs> <laughs> or do you want more time to think? <laughs> See, that's the hard part, right? Um, the non... well, I mean, just, you know, doubling our space allowed us to, to do that. Just moving through our old space was hard. Um, so, you know, having the space to store things or to review things or to have curatorial conversations was really important. Um, and, you know, I certainly thought about that. Having space to spread out was important. Um, you know, the tours have become really, we are really a shining jewel in the crown of this renovation. You know, we've been renovating for almost over 15 years and we're just finished phase three, which was special collections and we're still really benefiting from that um, limelight and um, that's been very important. So, I, and you know, collections conservators do a lot of things that aren't at the bench, as many of us know and to have the space to meet and the space to do training and hold workshops both internally or bringing people in has been very important for us. So for us, I think I'll specifically focus on our education and outreach program. And it was really, I had to fight really hard when we were looking at the square footage of our lab. And when you, when you get the blank slate, which all of us have now, it, it, it's, it's hard to parse out the space and recognize um, especially for me who was relatively new to the Illinois program and didn't have a lot of experience with what their needs were going to be, to figure out how much square footage we need for, needed for each. And I had to end up fighting really hard for our kind of all-purpose conference, classroom, what have you, space. Um, but that was the best argument I think I made because um, we bring so many workshops, graduate school classes, tours, advancement opportunities, et cetera, through that space that um, it has paid for itself tenfold. Um, and our, because we're a land grant institution, um, because we have that outreach to the community 
um, mentality already built into the library. And our library pushes very, very hard for all of our librarians to go out and do things for the community and do things around campus, et cetera. Um, that classroom space has been invaluable to allow us to do that. And I, I can't imagine being as successful as we are in bringing people in, in engaging people, in making people understand what conservation is. That's not a battle that fortunately I have to fight. People get it. Um, for whatever reason they do. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we're constantly putting ourselves out there. We're constant fi constantly finding reasons to bring people in. Um, so we're really closely tied now with the Graduate School of Library and Information Science and have a lot of faculty there who are better understanding preservation and conservation and better understanding the, the um, needs of that program and how the graduate students can come and get experience there and then go out and become special collections librarians who have understanding of, of conservation. And, and that's been a really um, important thing for us. So that, that classroom space and building that in has been really useful. I, I think for UVA, the, um, we've renovated or built a conservation lab, but I think the most important non-treatment space is the um, Wayto bug killer freezer. And <laughs> um, I think the, the freezer is in the preservation office with the book repair and having space to spread out the boxes and give a quick initial vacuum and then load up the freezer and stage all of that is really, really important. And I think everyone who works in a library knows that all sorts of things come in from all sorts of storage, previous storage situations and that you need to be ready to roll with it, whether it's bugs or mold or just lots and lots of dirt and mud dauber nests and what have you. So I think in terms of our overall all program, you know, there's never enough room for that and we're looking at building a, UVA is looking at building a second remote storage high density facility and we are, you know, strongly advocating for a treatment facility there so that we have room to spread out and room to stage boxes and room to put things, totes in plastic bags and so on. Um, in terms of the conservation lab, I think the lab is so small that I had to think about treatment in the conservation lab, but then where could I stash other workflows? So I have the Minter welder, as Bill well knows, in the stacks of the um, special collections building, and that's just where it fits and where the workflow fits, kinda. Um, <laughs> But um, what has been a real success is me giving up control of the photo doc. Um, originally, the plan had been to somehow fit a little copy stand and lights and camera in the conservation lab. And I said, well, that's it's just, it, that space is too much at a premium. And UVA has a huge di digitization workflow. There are, at this time, there are four copy stands with very current cameras, very fancy lights, um, all the computers they need, all the student workers they need, and they get funded and everything gets upgraded on a regular basis. So I partnered with them and said, hey, since you're digitizing things anyway, if I need a couple of photos of things, can I come in? Of course, no problem. So the benefit to me is I don't have to pay for cameras. I don't know have to have to know how the software works. I don't have to do quality control or figure out how to save files the right way. There are students who sort of take pity on me and do it for the old lady <laughs> who doesn't know computers. And <laughs> on the other hand, they get to see the conservation process in before and after because if I get things done, you know, before, you know, before they leave for the summer, they, they get to see that Jefferson letter come back looking much better and that's really exciting for them. And I get to spy on their workflows and make sure that all the students are really well trained and handle things very carefully and that the staff in general is very conscientious. So that has been a real benefit to, to my program that I hadn't anticipated. Um, and honestly, I don't, I think if you have a digitization workflow, um, that's, a, that's a great way to go because they, you know, at least in my world, they get, they get all the money um, and all the cameras and students and so on. So I'm, I'm tempted to give you my first answer thought, which was the staff lounge, <laughs> 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 which I think for all of us is pretty eye-opening and amazing. Uh, and 
I think it does actually serve as a great gathering place, and there are lots of people that we run into uh, for breaks. There are a lot of informal meetings. Um, I had a discussion about conservation space with someone from the Beinecke yesterday, uh, a couple of days ago, which was just over coffee, and that kind of thing didn't happen when we were all so dispersed because of the nature of, Sterling is a beautiful building, but Sterling is designed in a very particular way that's maze-like and really doesn't have a lot of bring you together spaces in terms of offices and staff. Um, I think too for us that the, the lab has enough space and certainly the examination room that we've built in is a place where we're thinking that's where we host scientists who come to do microfading testing or we can host a large project so that it's a sort of satellite space for our West Campus operations. Uh, it's a place where we could host a workshop with Soyun from the YCBA. Uh, and those things are all great. I think the other nice thing about this building is that the shared spaces are what really make a difference for us. There are meeting rooms for the first time ever that are conveniently located to our workspaces that are pleasant, that can be scheduled easily. This lecture and workshop, you know, what we're hosting today is so much easier to do uh, and easier to direct people. And so I think that's been really great for us to add to add that. And certainly because we are really thinking and defining laboratory as conservation lab as also conservation classroom. Uh, we really do want students in. And so it's great to have that space. It's great to have this room where we could hold a lecture or a small class um, or partner with someone. Um, the intake rooms that are across the hall from us from the Beinecke. Yesterday I looked at a book that was delivered to us, you know, that a curator is considering for acquisition. And so that was easy to run across the hall. Uh, and take a look at that. And so I think the synergies of our work and those relationships and the way that this new building space has been designed is, is an added plus in addition to an unbelievably fabulous laboratory space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, we have open to questions. Do people have questions or do they want to? Ray, go ahead. And yeah. anybody who wants to pass, who wants to pass a question into the center aisle, uh, Murray will pick up. But Ray, why don't you kick us uh, off? Okay, so while people are writing, um, <laughs> it seems like for a lot of you, getting this nice new space was uh, at the cost of moving away from the reading room. Uh, and I was just curious, uh, obviously there are pros and cons, but um, have there been significant cons being further away from where you might be needed for emergency sort of things or consultation or also uh, there's a lot of times people come for books and they're in conservation and, and not knowing where they are. So I was wondering if all of you, or all of you could address that sort of uh, trade-off. Jen, you were nodding. Sure. <laughs> I was nodding. <laughs> um, yes. I, I would say that they're really, I, I can think, I mean, our new space is awesome, and that's a huge pro. Um, it was the available space that we had. But given the choice, I would have had that new lab in the main library, absolutely positively. I mean, there is no benefit to not being near your stuff and not being near the curators. Um, we're fortunate that, similar to Eliza, at least preservation is in the main building. So when there is a crisis or something, there is there are trained staff to be able to respond to that. Um, however, um, we've had an ongoing challenge with shipping and the security of shipping, as well as just the security of moving moving not not the actual transport which is its own issue but then the did you get the stuff yes we got the stuff how are you proving that you got the stuff well we got this stuff and this stuff and going back to the rare book room and saying we got it and then them accusing when we get we send stuff back of them then saying you never sent the stuff yeah we sent the stuff um and it would be a lot easier if we were all in the same building and just carrying it down and saying here it is um, so that has been a huge challenge. I think with 10 years of practice, we have found a very workable solution for that. But unfortunately, that does frequently involve people's personal cars, which is not the way I'd like to do it. Um, but the fact is, is you can't always coordinate shipping to come and do last pickup at your building and first pickup at the main library and the security wise for special collections. You can't do anything but that. You're not going to leave it sitting in the truck. Um, so that has been a real challenge. And I think the, the biggest problem, honestly, um, we haven't had that many instances of someone trying to find something that's over in the lab. Um, usually, when that has happened, we can at least uh, you know account for it and get it over there or, or whatever. So that really hasn't been an issue. But for us, um, the the biggest challenge has just been the transport of materials. But then it's the 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 water cooler conversations. That's why I'm so jealous of here is that you you're with the special collection staff. So you can have those over coffee random conversations that being separated from all of our special collections we simply don't have. And there's a lot of really 
um, beneficial conversations that aren't scheduled at meetings that happen, um, that we now have to schedule time. And we do encourage all of our conservators to basically s schedule office hours more or less. Now the problem with us is that we have five distributed special collections. So it's not like we can just load, go one place and be there for an hour. We have to rotate through all of our special collections um, to be able to make sure that we're that available. And they're not even all in the main building. Um, but we do try very hard to get out to all those spaces. I would say the one benefit that we have with that is that because I'm the head of both preservation and conservation, I have offices in both buildings. So if they have a conservation question, they can often at least come to me and I'll be around. But that still isn't the same as talking to people who are actually treating their objects, which is not me. Anybody else? Sorry, I, I would echo a lot of what Jenna has to say and then I do have office hours every Thursday. I'm in special collections 9 to 12, and I'm doing rehousing projects, or I'm looking over books that ha have been acquired and, and adding them to my to-do list and sort of being a general pest so that people know I'm there to help out. And then I have meetings there um, and, and so on. And I think, um, and then when I have graduate students, I they they have office hours as well and i think wherever you wind up working you you do have to learn how to stage your projects and so i think that's just a really valuable experience it can be tricky though at least um, unlike jen i have uh, a van driver that i can just call up and say okay um, we need to schedule a trip and they think it's exciting to come to the conservation lab so they, they yeah they make it work <laughs> and i just then have to get uh, someone from special collections to ride shotgun and then stage the the roll it down the roll it through the tunnels to the loading dock but then it happens infrequently enough that everybody gets on board then again i have to work really hard to stage treatments and think okay I'm going to take in, like, in the, one of my pictures, there was a giant salter on the bench. Okay, I'm going to take in the two salters. Then that also means I have room for maybe two letters, and that's it. And then when I finish the salters, then I could maybe take in some architectural drawings. So I have to think really carefully about what I can accommodate in my space and get back to the reading room in a timely fashion. Things can't live out in my lab because people need them back there, and they can't just pop in and, and check a page. Um, every now and then, I've had a request. Well, a student has a project, and I'm like, well, okay, what does she, what date range does she need? And then I'll take pictures and send them. But um, yeah, so that's it. Yeah, a a civilian question. <laughs> Actually, two questions. One's very finite. One could be very expansive. Very <laughs> finite is what's the difference between conservation and preservation? More expansive is I see from your presentations a field that sounds like it's very new. If 1974 is the earliest date we have, and this is, you presumably represent the best of <laughs> conservation. <Yeah>. And, <laughs> like, that's, that's a little. and so it's worth a try. <laughs> Is this a new field? What was done before 1974? So, so I guess I'll take that. Yeah, yeah, I, I got a mic. Yes, <laughs> no, yeah. So the difference between preservation and conservation in the library field, library and archives, is preservation is the umbrella operation. In other words, it takes care of all sorts of things. It can deal with the HVAC, the environmental conditions. It can deal with commercial binding, reformatting, brittle paper, that sort of thing, as well as conservation and in individual treatments. So we're using preservation in a very broad way. Conservation is a more narrow. And the other question was as to the age of the field. Depends upon what you, I guess we would, where do we, where do, we, do, we do we start with the Florence flood? Yeah, we start with the Florence flood. 1966, when the Arno flooded, um, there was a huge response because of the number of libraries and archives in Florence that were totally inundated with water. And so people from all over the world came to help re rescue these materials. And because of this, there were experts, binders, scientists, who for the first time suddenly came together and had to work together rather than in their own little you know, studio or whatever, um, and sharing what worked best. And so at that point, the field, the field sort of marks that as being the beginning of 
conservation and library preservation as the start of the profession, as it were. There's always been bookbinders, there's always been restorers, um, but this was the first time that people really came together and started sharing the knowledge and deciding we need to do something in a more formal way. In Florence, they started training programs that really have been working on for 50 years the conservation of the materials that were rescued as a result of that flood. So, yeah. If I could just add to that a little bit. Um, before the Florence flood, there was a man named Mr. Barrow who was ah. laminating um, our do founding father documents at With the, the best of intentions. Yes, yes. <laughs> and and the reason I know this is because at the University of Virginia, we were very M Mr. Barrow was at the Library of Virginia in Richmond, Charlottesville's just up the road. We had oodles and oodles of Jefferson, Washington, Madison documents that were being laminated. Now, Mr. Barrow started out doing research on brittle paper and he was very worried about machine-made paper from groundwood pulp, and he was a scientist and did research and was like, gee, all this acidic paper is very brittle. What are we gonna do? We can't reverse the acids, so let's laminate everything like those, the, the um, driver's licenses we got back in the day. Um, and since doing something to brittle paper is worth doing while doing something to founding fathers documents is even better. So that effort started up um, before the Florence flood, but then people started noticing that plastic doesn't age very well and it started warp warping. And so that is another sort of thread of conservation where people were making the best efforts and they were doing it scientifically and they were taking notes and doing research and so on and then there were unintended consequences. And I think um, barrel lamination is one area where conservation then says, wow, one of our core concepts is we have to be reversible. We have to be very thorough in our research and very thorough in our approach because with the best of intentions, you can take all these very important documents and cover them in plastic and turn them into little laminated placemats and that's not what we want to do. Um, so that's another. The Library of Congress and the, um, well, Library of Congress got started after Florence Flood. Uh, National Archives had been, was the one that was sort of leading that. Um, what has happened as a result of that was they've also started undoing a lot of the Barrow stuff. Oh, yeah. Nancy? I would just say another landmark would be the Cooperstown program yes. in the 1950s, so that conservation of painting and art began before. Yes. Books right. Well, that started. So Har that Harvard yeah. had a training program. Right. Was apprentice right. Gettins started there. Yeah. yeah. So there, there's a long history. The museum programs are, and the the field of museum conservation is much older than the library. But I mean, if you go back to the Renaissance, there there were restorers. You know, <laughs> there was always somebody who could clean a painting or the fix a book. In the in-house department for conserving. For it's library really conservation. Perfect is 70s with the Library of Congress. I think they, they're yeah, pretty much the first one. I'm sorry? You still have binders. Binders, yes. Um, in fact, at Columbia University, what, is, what was the conservation department um, was in fact a bindery. And they had big machines that they took out. Um, same thing at the Newberry Library. There was a commercial bindery that really took, repaired the books, bound the books. So it was in the 70s and 80s where I sort of started to start seeing about how important the material culture, what we call material culture, and how important it is to, to save the, that information for scholars. So. so we can continue the conversation over wine. <laughs> um, we have a reception. Oh, one more question. Yes. One more question. It's related to the, the process of developing the design. Which other type of professional was involved besides you? In the like designers or architects or all in house? I think for, for our program, I can say, because it was very recent, uh, I remember it well, it's a combination. 
So we, there was an architectural firm who was responsible, Apicel and Bunton, for the design of this facility. Uh, as well as we had a consultant, Sam Anderson, who came in and did our initial space planning for the preservation department in general to help confirm our numbers. They also stayed on to do some, some technical consulting on some of the very unique things to conservation labs uh, because our architectural firm had not done a conservation lab before. Uh, one of the nice things is I feel like we had a very nice partnership with Apicel and Bunton about conservation. They were very interested in what we wanted to do and very open to our uh, helping to design. I mean, there we could even send little tracing paper drawings of different kinds of layout ideas, and they were not the least bit offended by that, and and um, able to turn it into something else and to help us, you know, refine the details. Uh, so I would say, yeah, it's it's a trio of you know a very specialized architect, our primary architectural firm, and then the staff themselves uh, in conservation, and also just the myriad of people that we've talked to throughout the field who have done labs before us. All of us had contacts. All of us had had some previous experience. You know what you like, you know what you don't like, and then you know you can call Jen or Eliza to say, how did you make that work? You know, what do I tell them? So. I would say Jen would be a next good one since you edited the book. Oh. <laughs> um, so speaking from, from, from my experience, I mean, there, there, I, I am, am jealous of bringing, able, being able to bring in Sam Anderson as a consultant. Most of us don't have that kind of funding um, available to us, um, or at least we didn't. Um, but I was fortunate. So we had an architectural firm, obviously, who was involved in the design, but they had no idea what conservation was. So there was a really big learning curve for them in trying to grapple, what, what is this space? What does it need to do? Why do you need a dirty room? What's a dirty room? Why do you need a fume hood? Is this a lab? Do we need to build a, a chemistry lab? No, it's not a chemistry lab, but it's like a chemistry lab, sort of. Um, so there was, there was a lot of education there, but where, where I really benefited was um, our head of facilities within our library, who was obviously very integrated in this because all construction goes through his office, was an architect um, previous to that. Um, so he served as a really great translator because he understood the library, he understood the needs. I actually have a fantastic relationship with him. He really gets preservation um, and understood what conservation was and what we were trying to do. And so I could talk at him and he'd understand what I was saying and then he could talk to the architect and tell the architect what the architect wanted to know, which I had a really hard time doing. Um, so that relationship was actually really, really beneficial to us. Stephanie, you want to say anything to add? I would just say it's, it's really important for staff to take the time to really think through what they want in terms of workflows and workplace flow adjacency and to really work out their arguments as for why things need to be the way they are. I designed, renovated and then designed a new lab at the Smithsonian Libraries and the fact that all the staff chimed in and did mock-ups after mock-up after mock-up of the workspace really made a huge difference. And it, we were part of, at the Smithsonian, a very big, big project. We were just this little cog. And so we would, every, they, they produce, what is it, 35% drawings, 55% drawings, 75% drawings. And every time a big set of drawings comes out, we were given a half hour with those drawings to go through everything and double check that all the people with the CAD programs were doing everything correctly. So we would just run into the room. They would literally like open the door. We'd run in. It's like, you take the plumbing. I'll take the electric. Da, 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 da. And we would just go through it and say, like, OK, do they still have the fume trunks in there? Do they still have the exhaust fans on the, on the roof? And then things would drop out. And you would just put a little post-it, and the architect would say, great, thank you. OK, thanks. OK, thanks. Because they're not checking the work the way you check the work. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that they've dropped a, a fan off the ceiling, which would, you know, down the road meet a huge uh, price tag. And maybe they, do you really need that fume trunk? You know, because we're going to have to punch a hole in the building. So I think taking that time and really being sure of what your needs are and what the things that you need to check out and the drawings are, make, that makes a huge difference. And then um, in terms of the, my work at UVA, um, when I was planning the lab that didn't happen, um, again, being very passionate and being very articulate about why the things need to be, be the way they are. Um, we had a collaborative conservation facility, that's what we kept calling it, 
And so it was going to be a paintings lab, a paper, art on paper lab, a book conservation lab, and then the office of the architect, one of this huge sort of pieces of buildings lab. So very different operations, but the architect kept saying, oh, we don't want walls. We want everybody to collaborate. You've got to be able to collaborate. And it's like, we can walk through doors if need be. <laughs> <laughs> How about giving us a shared resource room or library with you know the kitchen and the lunchroom and what have you? So and so is going to be making dust because that's what the architecture does. Um, paintings people aren't going to want that anywhere near, and they're going to need different lighting and different different paint on the walls than the book people and and so on. So you just you have to keep making those arguments um, because it's really important that you win them. <laughs> it's very <laughs> say that um, it is also sometimes helpful to bring in somebody who, from the outside, who can say mm -hmm. things. And I've served that function. I've been a consultant on lab renovation projects for other institutions. And I'm saying the exact same thing their staff is, but because I don't work there, there's a different level of listening. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we don't all charge. Fifty thousand dollars a day, and so if you're if you need an extra nudge to to say why it's important, there's people out there who will give you a day or two or three or a week of your time that's affordable, and it's just another voice mm -hmm. to add to the to the din of voices <laughs> that they hear every day. All right, thank you very much, and the wine is out the door to the right.